Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome this evening to uh, the talk by Professor Chantal Mouf, whom I'm very pleased to welcome. I think it's her first visit to the Graduate Institute, and uh, so it's a special pleasure to have you with us uh, today. As you know, the lecture has been organized by the Albert Hirschman Center uh, on Democracy. We have a regular lecture series. This is the first of our three lectures in this semester. Let me very briefly um, introduce um, uh, Chantal and her work. I think most of you know it as well as I do, but I think by way of introduction, let me just uh, make a few points about her intellectual trajectory and give you some background to the talk that you're going to hear today on ethics of democracy. Chantal is a political theorist educated in Paris, uh, Louvain, and Essex. She holds the chair of political theory at the University of Westminster and um, is a professor at the Department of Politics and International Relations, where she also directs the Center uh, for the Study of Democracy. She has taught all over Europe and North America, but also and especially in Latin America, uh, having held research positions at Harvard, at Cornell, the University of California, Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, where she was a visiting fellow twice. And as I learned from her this afternoon, she had the pleasure of meeting and then later also befriending Albert Hirschman and Albert and Sarah, actually. So she knew them personally very well. So that is another reason why I'm really pleased that we've been able to get her here in the midst of a very, very busy program. She was a fellow at the Institute of Human Sciences in Vienna uh, last uh, spring, and that is when she was working on this particular project, The Politics of Affects, and this is where I thought this would be an extremely important addition to our series of lectures, particularly because Chantal's work challenges so much of mainstream political theory and so much of conventional wisdom on liberal democracy and what ails it. So in her new work, she has been looking at the process of the collect, uh, construction of political identities, taking her bearings from Spinoza and Freud, who has, as you know, who have both of them insisted on the centrality of desire as um, something that moves human beings to act. And uh, the fact that we need to take affect seriously if we want to understand what makes people act in one way or another. So she examines in her new work what she calls passions or common affects and how these are mobilized to constitute collective identities. She thinks they play a central role in the construction of a distinction between we and they, a distinction which she thinks is absolutely constitutive of political struggle. And what effects uh, these mobilizations of affects have had and how they can be mobilized to create a collective will, one that can invigorate democratic ideals. That has been a major thread through her writing. So for her, the mobilization of affects and populism are not perversions of democracy, but can play a role and also must play a role in redirecting, rejuvenating democracy today. As many of you know, Chantal has been a very prominent critic uh, of liberal democracy, especially of deliberative democracy in its Rawlsian version, in its Habermasian version as well. And uh, she's also equally well known for her rather critical um, use of the work of Carl Schmitt, mainly his concept of the political, which is something you will hear about today. And she proposes a radicalization of modern democracy in terms of what she has called agonistic pluralism. So this is the quest for a politics, where she thinks that a quest for a politics of consensus, which is what underlies a liberal and a deliberative understanding of democracy, is something which undermines our ability to challenge it. And in her search for a radical and a plural democracy that can deal with diversity and difference, but not in terms of building a consensus, she develops her groundbreaking political theory of the 
agonistic. We're going to hear something about her critique of the model of deliberative uh, democracy, which mistakenly assumes that rational political debate should aim at consensus, and that is what is lacking um, when it is confronted by a populist challenge. Instead, she has argued that the political has two characteristics at its core, antagonism and hegemony. And any kind of mobilization needs passions or common effects, as these are at the core of forming our collective identities. So our most important work, as many of you will remember, is the, her, maybe her earliest and most important work, 1985, Hegemony and Socialist Strategy Towards Radical Democratic Politics with Ernesto Laclau. And her most recent books are The Democratic Paradox in 2000, On the Political 2005, Agonistics in 2013, and then her edited volume on Podemos. She has written a lot on um, Podemos, and the new book is called In Defense of Left Populism. It is due to appear in English this summer in German, French, um, uh, Italian, and other translations in September. And here there is an argument which will resonate with the, uh, the talk today that populism is, of course, an expression of a crisis in liberal democratic politics, but it's much more than an ideology, much more than a political regime. It's a way of doing politics that can take various forms, and Chantal makes a very powerful case for a new way to define and understand left populism because he th she thinks this is in fact, the most adequate political force to recover and constitute democracy. And she thinks that it's a struggle between populisms today that we are witnessing, and what Im the kind of populism that will emerge victorious from this conflict will be the uh, will shape the way post politics or post democratic politics will take. So Chantal's work has been central not only to rethinking many concepts in democratic theory, but equally so in Marxism and feminism. She's uh, worked a lot with uh, Gramsci, as many of you know. But it has also engaged with contemporary political debates and uh, intellectual debates. And she has been, as I said, not only a critic of liberal uh, theory, but equally a critic of orthodox Marxism, as well as mainstream feminism thinking in terms of varieties of identity politics which underlie her notion of radical democracy. So thank you very much for being with us tonight, and the word is yours. Well, thank you very much, Charlene, for this introduction and for this invitation. For me, as you say, it's a particular pleasure to speak of the Hirschman Center for Democracy because uh, uh, Albert Hirschman was a very good friend and I had a lot of uh, admiration and affection for him. And uh, you know, this is really nice to be able to speak in a place which has been dedicated to celebrate its memory. Um, so, the effects of democracy. Emotion and affect have recently become a very fashionable topic among philosophers and people working in social science and the humanities. In fact, there is a growing literature on what has been called the affective term. It designates a very heterogeneous body of works, among which it is not easy to find, to use a term from Wittgenstein, ressemblance de famille, family resemblance. Um, but the reason for that is that the theories who are sometimes put under the umbrella of the affective turn come from a variety of approaches, which is rather difficult to reconcile. They disagree on the very meaning of the term affects and emotion, not to speak of their relation. Some of them are influenced by the work of Deleuze and Guattari, other by the neurosciences, other by a variety of constructivist school. Well, 
I have, for a long time in my work, put a special emphasis on what I call the role of passion in politics. And I would like in this presentation to clarify what I understand by passion and how I see their role in politics. In fact, I've been often asked why I speak of passion instead of emotion. And this is why I want to stress that from the perspective that I advocate, it is essential to distinguish between passion and emotion. It is with regard to the political domain that my approach has been elaborated. And one of its central tenets is that in that field, we are always dealing with collective identities, something that I think the term emotion does not adequately convey. Because emotions are usually, not always, but usually attached to individual. To be sure, passion can also be of an individual nature, but I have chosen to use that term with this somewhat more violent connotation because it allows me to underline the dimension of conflict and to suggest a confrontation between political identities, and I insist for me political identities are always collective identities, two aspects that I take to be constitutive of politics. I contend that without understanding the crucial role played by common affects in the constitution of political form of identification, it is not possible to envisage what is at stake in democratic politics. After presenting in the first part the main tenets of my theoretical approach, I will in the second part show how this approach is particularly suited to grasp the nature of the populist moment that characterizes our present conjuncture and how to answer the challenge that it represents. To understand what I mean by passion and how I see their role in politics requires to be acquainted with the theoretical framework that informs my approach. This approach has been first elaborated in Hegemony and Socialist Strategy, the book that I wrote jointly with Ernesto Laclau, where we have argued that two fundamental concepts are needed to elaborate a theory of the political. Shalini has already made reference to that in her introduction. Those two concepts are antagonism and hegemony. The concept of antagonism is central because it postulates the existence of what we call a radical negativity that impedes the totalization of society and foreclose the possibility of a society beyond division and power. It is linked to the concept of hegemony in the following way. <coughs> to assert the ineradicability of antagonism requires acknowledging the impossibility of reaching a final ground and recognizing the dimension of indecidability and the contingence that pervades every order. It is precisely to this dimension of indecidability and contingence that the category of hegemony refers. It is indicated that every society is the product of practices that seek to institute an order but always in a context of contingency, and that is this order is always precarious, and never a definitive order. The social, in this view, is constituted by what we call sedimented hegemonic practices. That is, practices that appear to proceed from a natural order, and by that it conceal the original acts of their contingent political institution. This perspective reveals that every order results from the temporary and precarious articulation of contingent practices. Every order is the expression of a particular structure of power relation. This is what you know, call every order is an hegemonic order is always established through the exclusion of other possibilities. And it's from there that it acquires its political character. 
IF later, that was after a German socialist strategy following uh, wars, suggested distinguishing between the political, and by that I refer to the dimension of radical negativity, dimension of antagonism, and politics, which deals with the ontic manifestation of this ontological dimension. Here, of course, I'm using a Heideggerian vocabulary, you know, distinguishing the ontic and the ontological. So antagonism is the level of the ontological, but its manifestation are, you know, ontic manifestation. And this antagonism, in fact, can emerge within a large variety of social relations. So not only, and here, here is a difference, for instance, Marxism, a, Marx, a Marxism recognized antagonism, but limited to the class antagonism. While uh, uh, in our work, we insist that they are other antagonism than class antagonism. You know, and this is why, in fact, we also think that we need a, a, a progressive left project need to articulate the, the struggle against different form of domination. <coughs> Politics aims, in fact, at establishing an order and organizing human coexistence under condition which are always traversed, so to speak, by the political. And this is why politics is always conflictual. In fact, this distinction between politics and the political is not something you know, that uh, uh, I'm all, the only one in, 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 in um, proposing. Uh, we find it in other theories. Uh, not always the same signification, and sometimes it can be rather confusing, you know, because uh, uh, once we are the political, and you think we all mean the same thing. No, it means the, the different thing in different theories. Uh, but to clarify things, we can, in fact, distinguish two opposing ways of characterizing the political, and there are different schools according to, to how it's characterized. Uh, there are those for whom the political refers to a space of liberty, of common action, acting in common, and that is uh, um, called the associative view of the political. While there are others who see the political as the site of conflict and antagonism. And this second approach is called the dissociative conception of the political, and of course this is the approach that you know, I advocate personally. And in fact, the thesis that I defend is that it's only when the ineradicable character of division and antagonism is recognized that it is possible to think in a properly political manner and to grasp the challenge confronting democratic politics. Taking account of the dimension of the political signifies acknowledging the existence of conflict that cannot have a rational solution. In fact, this is precisely what a, an antagonism is. Antagonism is a specific type of conflict, an, a conflict that cannot have a rational solution. Uh, not all conflicts are of that nature, but they are, you know, some which are, and of course this is the conflict which are properly political in my uh, view. The thing that political <coughs> conflicts are antagonistic because they always involve decision which require a choice between alternatives which are undecidable from a strictly rational point of view. And this is why I think that political life will never be able to dispense with antagonism for it concern public action and the formation of collective identities. It aims at constituting a we, but always in a conflict, in a context, sorry, of diversity and conflict. Yet, in order to constitute a we, one must distinguish it from a day. I mean, this, of course, is, is something that we uh, uh, probably you know, not necessarily take for granted, and I have a whole philosophical uh, development um, that I cannot present here in order to, to explain why there is no we without, without a day. But that's a central thesis in my work. So to constitute a we, one must distinguish it from a day. 
So there are always the possibility that under certain conditions, because it's not always the case, we can have we day which are not antagonistic. They are simply expression of differences. But there are always the possibility that this we day will become a form of antagonism. And in that case, it becomes a relation between friend and enemy, form of you know, typical political confrontation. And this is why I have argued that the crucial question for democratic politics is not to reach a consensus without exclusion, because in fact, this will amount to creating a we without a corresponding day, and that, of course, is something which, according to my, my theory, is impossible. But then what democratic politics should do is to construct the we day discrimination, which is necessary in politics, to construct it in a mode which is compatible with pluralist democratic institution. This is, in fact, something that most liberal democratic theories have to elude because of the inadequate way in which they envisage pluralism. While recognizing that we live in a world where a multi there is a multiplicity of perspectives and values, and that it is impossible, but they think that it's impossible for empirical reason, that each of us will adopt them all, while for me it's for an ontological reason. So those uh, liberal theorists imagine that bring together all those perspectives, in fact, constitute a harmonious and non-conflictual ensemble. That is, it means that we, because we are inscribed uh, in, in the reality, we can't see uh, uh, all of the perspective, but if we were from outside, from, so to speak, the point of view of Cyrus, we will see all those values uh, and see that, in fact, they constitute an homogeneous ensemble. So that's the way in which pluralism is understood by uh, liberal democratic theories. Not all of them, but most of them. And of course, this type of thought is incapable of accounting for the necessary conflictual nature of pluralism. Here, I defend the view of pluralism that we find in Max Weber, for instance, or, or in Nietzsche. You know, the conflict of, 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 the, 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 of the gods. You know, the, 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 this is something which is, for me, uh, the view of pluralism which uh, uh, corresponds to really the theoretical approach that I, I defend. Uh, and, of course, this means that uh, pluralism necessarily is conflictual. It stems from the impossibility of reconciling all point of view. And this is precisely something that liberal democratic thought usually does not acknowledge. And this is why it's born to negate the political in its antagonistic dimension. To be sure, liberal pluralists acknowledge that in democracy, the people can no longer be considered as one, but they see it as being multiple. While according to the hegemonic perspective, it should be understood as divided. There's a big, big difference between saying the people is divided, you know, so, so there is necessarily an antagonism, and people are multiple, but it's a multiplicity which is, you know, can, can be kind of reconciled. There is basically no uh, frontier uh, uh, in, in that divide the, the people. And of course, for me, politics is necessarily got to do, and we'll come to that later, to the construction of a frontier. After writing hegemony and socialist strategy, while scrutinizing the discussion among liberal democratic theories, I've realized that neither the aggregative model nor the deliberative model, which are basically the two models that we find, you know, uh, aggregative is the one that we find in, influenced by Schumpeter that we find in political science. The, the deliberative is Habermas and Rawls, usually found in, 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 in Philo philosophy, political uh, theory. And I, I, I um, in fact, when I began to study those um, models, I realized that uh, neither of them 
could allow us to visualize the possibility of a democratic hegemonic politics. And this is the proper, after having written hegemonic socialist strategy, I went to the, okay, but you know, how is it, according to this approach, uh, how can we think of the possibility of, of a democratic hegemonic politics? And I realized that you know, this is not possible to uh, understand that either according to the associative, uh, 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 aggregative sorry, model or the deliberative uh, one. So this is why I began to try to establish, the develop, elaborate a different model that will allow to understand democracy with hege hegemony. To give account of the ineradicability of antagonism, and the hegemonic nature of politics, it was therefore necessary to develop an approach able to address the following question. How could a democratic order recognize the existence and manage this existence of conflict that do not have a rational solution? How to conceive democracy in a way that allows in this midst a confrontation between conflicting hegemonic projects? Well, my answer to this question is precisely what I call the agonistic model of democracy that I see as providing the analytical framework necessary to visualize the possibility of a democratic confrontation between hegemonic projects. According to the agonistic model that I developed in several of my writing, to conceive pluralist democracy in a way that does not deny the antagonistic dimension supposes envisaging two possible modes of manifestation of the antagonistic dimension. Because the, the, the question really at stake here is that if you recognize antagonism, how is it possible to imagine a pluralist democracy? For instance, I've got a little debate with Carl Schmitt about that because Schmitt declared, no, but that is, uh, pluralist democracy is impossible because it would necessarily li li lead to civil war. You know, if, if we allow, uh, legitimize this conflict, in, uh, it's an antagonistic conflict, and I think Schmitt is right, uh, if one can only understand antagonism on the basis of the friend and enemy. But my uh, uh, the whole question is precisely to think that, or to show that in fact there is another way. Uh, the, this antagonistic dimension can manifest itself in another mode, key, what, which is the mode which I call agonistic. That is a confrontation, not the mode of a friend and enemy, because the enemy you have need to eradicate, I mean, the view, you can't accept legitimacy, I mean, you are going to eradicate it. And of course, this is incompatible with a pluralist democracy. But this antagonism can also take the form of an agonism. In that case, we are uh, faced with a confrontation between adversaries. The antagonistic and, uh, uh, the party, uh, sorry, the agonistic confrontation is different from the uh, antagonistic one not because it will allow for a possible consensus, but because in that case, the opponent is not considered as an enemy to be destroyed, but as an adversary whose existence is perceived as being legitimate. Our ideas will be fought with vigor, but a right to defend those ideas will never be questioned. So it's very different, you know, the, the, the agonistic uh, model of democracy than the, this antagonistic view of politics. Asserting the constitutive character of social division and the impossibility of a final reconciliation, the agonistic perspective recognizes the necessary partisan character of democratic politics. By envisaging this confrontation in terms of adversaries and not as a friend and enemy mode, because as I was saying, this might indeed lead to civil war, it allows such a confrontation to take place within democratic institution. In fact, what is at stake in the agonistic struggle is the very configuration of power relation that structure a social order and the type of hegemony that they construct. It is a confrontation between conflicting hegemonic projects hegemonic project that can never be reconciled 
rationally. So politics is always partisan. This is, of course, why you know, I'm so critical of the idea of consensus. So it, according to this view, the antagonistic dimension is always present because this is something that you know I want to, ins to insist on the same time of ineradicability of antagonism and nevertheless on the possibility of imagining a pluralist democracy. So the antagonistic dimension is present, but it is enacted by means of a confrontation whose procedures are accepted by the adversaries. So they are not treating each themselves as enemies. Such an agonistic perspective takes account of the fact that every social order is politically instituted and that the ground on which hegemonic intervention occurs is never neutral, for it is always the product of previous hegemonic practices. And of course, this is also another of, of my uh, 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 problem and, and discussion with certain type of liberal theory, which is the ground of politics as, as being neutral. Ground of politics is never neutral. It's always an hegemonic construction. And according to my view, the public sphere is in fact the battlefield on which hegemonic confront project confront each other without, and I insist on that, any possibility of a final reconciliation. So the distinction between antagonism, I remember, friend, enemy, and agonism, adversaries, permits to understand why, contrary to what many democratic theories believe, it is not necessary to negate the ineradicability of antagonism in order to visualize the establishment of a democratic order. In fact, it's interesting to see here that, in a sense, Schmidt and Habermas, the, 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 while, of course, they, they are I mean, they've got something in common. It's the fact that they do not accept the possibility of uh, having, uh, 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 the, at the same time, the recognition of antagonism and pluralist democracy. So, Schmidt, for that reason, negates the possibility of pluralist democracy. But Habermas, what he negates is the ineradicability of antagonism, because he also believes that if you acknowledge antagonism, you cannot have a pluralist democracy. And he wants to defend pluralist democracy, so he says, no, it's, there is no this ineradicability of antagonism. Uh, but my, 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 my uh, 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 challenge is to say, no, it's possible to have both recognize antagonism and nevertheless to have a pluralist democracy. In fact, I assert that agonistic confrontation, far from representing a danger for democracy, is in reality the very condition of its existence. In fact, no, I, I realize that's a point in which uh, I think uh, 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 Alfred Hirschman uh, uh, agrees. In, he's, got, he's got a very nice article on, uh, insisting on the importance of, of, of conflict in democracy. Um, to be sure, democracy cannot survive without a certain form of consensus, what I call a conflictual consensus, consensus that refers to the allegiance to the ethical political values that constitute what I call a principle of legitimacy a principle of legitimacy, which in the case of uh, 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 pluralist uh, liberal democracy are liberty and equality for all. Uh, so that we need to have this uh, uh, consensus on, on basic you know, uh, consensus on the principle of legitimacy. Uh, but we also have the possibility of conflict about different interpretation of those uh, uh, principles. Uh, because obviously we can agree, yes, liberty and equality for all, but how are we going to understand liberty? How are we going to understand equality? Big problem to you know all of political theories about that, and for all, but who is the all? You know, are we going to include the immigrants or not? And so there, there is always the di different conflicting interpretation about those. We agree on the values, but we disagree about the way they are going to be interpreted and implemented. This is for me what the agonistic struggle is about. In, on the political, and uh, uh, later on in agonistic, examining the current state of European democracies, I have argued that we are witnessing a crisis of representation, which is due to the lack, precisely, of this agonistic framework. 
And this is the consequence of what I call the post-political consensus, uh, the, the consensus at the center that has been established during the 30 years, and of course as a consequence of neoliberal uh, hegemony, between the parties of the center right and the center left. This consensus, which is based on the idea that there is no alternative to neoliberal globalization, remember Margaret Thatcher and her famous Tina, there is no alternative, but this has been something which has been basically accepted by center right and center left parties, you know, in, uh, and that's what I call post politics. And of course, the consequence of that is that it does entrench the existing neoliberal hegemony. There is no alternative. By not providing the possibility of an agonistic confrontation between different political projects, this consensus deprived the citizen of a voice in the election. Here, for instance, I think that the, one of the slogans of the uh, Spanish indignados was very clear. Uh, they say, tenemos voto, but no tenemos voz. We have a vote, but we don't have a voice. Of course, if you are going to vote, uh, and, and, but basically there is no fundamental difference between the, the, the program of the parties, you don't have a voice. And for me, this is something which is very negative for democracy. By postulating that we now live in societies, where collective identities have disappeared and where the opposition between left and right has become obsolete, and this political, uh, uh, post-political perspective, which has been theorized by, by Anthony Giddens in his book Beyond Left and Right, but also by uh, Ulrich Beck, uh, uh, which are you know, really the, the theorists more uh, Giddens than, than, than uh, Beck, because Beck uh, later on evolved in, different way, but basically at the time of the establishment of the third way uh, and the dritte method of, of uh, uh, Schroeder, this was the idea, you know, that, that uh, um, this post-political uh, 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 moment, of, and they don't call it post-political, of course, but this consensus, the, uh, the, the, the third way was in fact a big progress from the de democracy. Uh, uh, but I would argue, and that was in the, um, already in, on the political, published in 2005, that this was not at all a progress for democracy. This was something that was very having very negative consequences for, for democracy. Because uh, um, this political, post-political perspective refused to acknowledge that politics always consists in establishing a frontier, a frontier between we and they. Proclaiming, as they were doing, that the adversarial model of politics had been overcome. Uh, this is the consequences of curtailing the agonistic dynamics and, of course, to impede the crystallization of collective form of identification around democratic political objective. And this is what explains the multiplication of other forms of collective identities of moral, religious, of ethnic nature. It is also, and I think that uh, 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 a problem that I already uh, uh, was, you know, pointing out in 2005, which, but it's become much worse since then, because it explained, in my view, the success of right-wing populist parties which are often the only ones to claim that there is an alternative and that they are going to give the people back the power that the elite have taken away from them. I, mean, I will come back in the second part of my presentation on, on this. But you know, I think it's very important in my argument to show that post-politics, in fact, is uh, uh, got negative consequences for democracy. It leads to uh, abstention. Why are we going to have to vote if it doesn't make any difference? But also to the development of parties. We say, no, but there is an alternative. You know, we, we, we are going to speak uh, uh, in the name of the people. But in order to address this question of populism, I first need to tackle the issue of passion in the field of politics. As I have already indicated, by using the term passion, I want to distinguish my reflection from the issue of individual emotion, you know, which is typical of the affective term. By passion, I designate a certain type of common affect. 
those common affect that are mobilized in the political domain in the formation of we, they form of identification. My aim is to challenge the rationalist view dominant in democratic political theory, underlining both the collective and the partisan character of political action. It was precisely what was denied by the, 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 the third way and saying, no, we are no, no more collective subject, victory of individualism, you know, and no more antagonism, no more adversaries. So this is my, my, my target. And of course, what I want to bring to the light is the crucial role played by affects in the construction of political identities. One of my key criticisms of liberal democratic theories is their incapacity to acknowledge this affective dimension. Incapacity which I take to be the consequence of their picture of the individual presented as acting in the field of politics, either as moved by the pursuit of her interest, that's the iterative model, or by moral concern, that's the deliberative one. This precludes them from recognizing the collective nature of political action and asking one of the key questions for politics. All are collective form of identification created and what is the part played by affects in this process? In fact, this is the issue that my reflection on passion aims at addressing. Remember that I'm posing this question within the post-foundationalist ontological framework that I have outlined earlier. Crucial to this framework is the assertion of the discursive nature of the social and the thesis that there is no essential identities but only form of identification. So the approach that we develop in hegemony and socialist strategy is basically a non-essentialist conception. And that, of course, is absolutely central to all of my uh, reflection. What is at stake in politics is the construction of political identities. Political identities are never given. They are, they are always constructed discursively. And this construction always entails an affective dimension what Freud called a libidinal investment. Freud is central for my reflection because besides asserting the general thesis that the social link is a libidinal link, and that's something which is very, you know, I very much agree with, with this view, he also brought to the fore the crucial role played by this affective libidinal bond in processes of collective identification. As he stated in his book, group psychology and the analysis of the ego, and here I'm quoting Freud, a group is clearly held together by a power of some kind. And to what power could this feast be better ascribed than to eros, which hold together everything in the world, end of quote. For Freud, affection are the qualitative, uh, sorry, affects are the qualitative expression of the quantity of libidinal energy of the instinct. This libidinal energy is malleable and can be oriented in multiple directions, producing different effects. This point is very important to realize that different forms of politics can foster different affective libidinal attachment. And I think that this is very important because it helps us to refute the essentialist view that adjudicate given effect to specific social agents. That there is a whole uh, discussion today, but uh, uh, if, for instance, the, some people uh, argue that the people who vote for uh, right-wing populist parties are, it's not even point to try to tame, shame them by because they are inherently uh, uh, homophobe, racist, uh, sexist. Uh, this is something which is, you know, th their identity like, is like that. And of course, you know, I, I, this is something I totally disagree because it's a completely essentialist uh, view. So to explicit this, this, this point of the libidinal uh, energy that is malleable and can, you know, produce different form of uh, politics, I want to bring 
some insight from Spinoza conception of the affect. Namely, his distinction between what he called affectio and by affection and affectus affect. Like Freud, Spinoza believed that it is desire that moves human beings to act. And he notes that what makes them act in one direction rather than in another are the affects. An affection, here, remember, affection is not affect. affect he distinguished between affection and affect. Affectio, uh, the, it, of course, he writes that in Latin, and affectus. So an affection for him is a state of a body insofar as it is, it is, uh, as, uh, as it is subject to the action of another body. So it means you are affected you know, by, by, by something, by another body. That's an affection. When affected by something exterior, the conatus, by that uh, Spinoza I means the general striving to persevere in our being, is one of his fundamental concepts, the, the conatus will experience affects. So when affected, the conatus will experience affect that will move it to desire something and act accordingly. So there is affection, affection, create affects, desire, and this is what makes us act. I find this dynamic of affection, affectus, helpful to envisage the process of production of common affects. And I propose to employ this dynamic to examine the mode of construction of political identities, seeing affection as the space where the discursive and the affective are articulated in specific practices. Here is something, of, I don't have time to develop that, but important to show you political consequences that we need to imagine what kind of, if we understand by uh, uh, affection, discursive, affective practices, you know, we are going, it means that politics, we need to envisage what kind of those affections are the ones, for instance, that are required to develop some kind of, uh, well, for me, left populism, but in general, progressive politics. You know, what kind of practices are important in order to uh, 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 produce certain kind of identification? On the importance of practices, because I think for me this is absolutely central, the question of practices, I take my inspiration from Wittgenstein, who taught us that it is by their inscription in what he calls language game, and in fact by language game is what we call discursive practices, that social agents form specific belief and desire and acquire their subjectivity. Here I want to insist on, on, on something which is, you know, it's a point that has been sometimes badly understood by this cursive, and it's of course something which is central in hegemony socialist strategy. I'm not referring to practices concerned exclusively with speech or writing, but to signifying practices in which signification and action cannot be separated. This is why it means the same thing as language game in, in Wittgenstein, because language in Wittgenstein is not simply game of languages. It's, it always involves practical action. So in the view of Wittgenstein, allegiance to democracy is not something based on rationality, but in participation in specific form of life, in specific practices. As Richard Rorty is often pointed out, a Wittgensteinian perspective makes us realize that allegiance to democracy and the belief in the value of its institution does not depend on giving them an intellectual foundation. He's got a lot of debate with Habermas precisely about that. Uh, but it is created through an ensemble of language day game which construct democratic form of individuality. And it is important to note here that Wittgenstein clearly acknowledges the affective dimension of this allegiance that he likens to what he called a passionate 
commitment to a system of references. So there is definitely something affective in, in, in there. So what I propose is to bring together Spinoza, Freud, and Wittgenstein, and to see inscription in discursive affective practices as providing the affection, which for Spinoza will bring about the affect that will spur desire and make us act, that is to see them as the moving force of political action. Uh, and of course, it's a way to recognize that affects and desire play a constitutive central role in the creation of collective form of identification. And this is why they are the moving force of political action. Well, I submit that this recognition of the crucial role of affects and of the way in which they can be mobilized in different direction is decisive for understanding democratic politics. And now I'm going to argue in the second part of this presentation that such a theoretical perspective is necessary to comprehend the nature of what I call the populist moment that we are currently witnessing and to envisage how to face the challenge that it represents. <laughs> to adequately address this question, it is first necessary to discard the simplistic vision propagated by the media presenting populism as mere demagogy, and to adopt an analytical perspective. And I propose to follow Ernesto Laclau in his book, The Populist Reason, define populism as a way to construct the political frontier between we and, and them, and to construct it by appealing to the mobilization of the underdog against those in power. So it's a way to distinguish the we them. The we is the underdog and the, the, the them, the they is the uh, establishment, the, the, those in power. And populism emerge when one's aim at building a new subject of collective action, the people, people the name for the underdog, capable of reconfiguring a social order, which is lifts and fair. So they are moments, I mean, in which populism emerges, a moment in which precisely there, there is the need to transform the social order. Populism, insists Laclau, and I, I think that's absolutely crucial, is not an ideology. It's not a political regime. It does not have a specific programmatic content. So this is why they could be populism of the right, populism of the left. It's a way of doing politics, a strategy which can take various forms depending on the period and the places, and it is compatible with different forms of government. For instance, I'm going to argue that it's also compatible because people are oh, populism needs to dictatorship. No, I think populism is perfectly compatible with a, a, a pluralist democracy. Of course, some populism have led, left to fascist regime. But there are many other forms, and it's a mistake to affirm that all of them are incompatible with the existence of liberal democratic institution. Indeed, this type of mobilization can have democratizing result. This was, for instance, the case with the populist movement in the United States at the turn of the 19th century that was able to redistribute the political power in favor of the majority without putting in question the whole democratic system. That's a book for this, this, this uh, uh, populism has been uh, um, studied by Michael Kazin, and that he, he showed precisely the, the way in which this populist movement, uh, it was short term, it did not last long, but it had a very important democratizing influence in, in the, uh, uh, US politics. In fact, populism, Populism, uh, <laughs> for me, constitutes an important dimension of democracy. It's not uh, people of God, it's a pathology of democracy. Uh, 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 it's a perversion of democracy. For me, it's a necessary 
component of democracy uh, because it refers to the dimension of popular sovereignty, the construction of a demos. And after all this demos, you got democracy. You can't have a, a democracy without the demos. And the moment of populism, of construction of the people is precisely you know, what uh, I, I think is this dimension of democracy. You don't have a, a real democracy without a demos. Scrutinizing the, gro the growth of a populist type of politics in Europe at the moment, and in fact, I'm uh, particularly interested because I think that uh, uh, we need to distinguish between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. The, 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 the political... Uh, uh, the political history of those countries is, is very different. So, in fact, in the book that uh, uh, I've just finished, which is called, in fact, For a Left Populism, uh, I, I'm concentrated on Western uh, Europe because I, but I think that, uh, uh, you know, and I say, of course, there are other forms of populism, Latin American populism, but it, it is on the basis of a specific conjuncture that you can understand, you know, what's at stake and how you can, you know, react to, to, to this uh, situation. So, this is why I think the whole populist type of in Western Europe, we ascertain that it is due to the convergence of several phenomena that in recent years have affected the condition in which democracy is exercised in our societies. The first phenomenon is the one that I've already mentioned and that I call post politics, refer to the blurring of the frontier between right and left. As we have seen, it is the result of the consensus established between the parties of the center right and center left on the idea that there was no alternative to neoliberal globalization. Under the pretext of modernization, big you know, uh, uh, mantra of, of the third way, uh, modernization, which they say is imposed by globalization, social democratic parties all over Europe have in fact accepted the diktat of financial capitalism and the limit they impose to state intervention and to the redistributive policies of, of the states. The role of parliaments and institutions that allow citizens to influence political decisions has been drastically reduced. Elections no longer offer an op any opportunity to decide on a real alternative through the traditional parties of government and citizens have in fact been deprived of the possibility of exercising their democratic rights. Popular sovereignty, the notion which I think constitutes the very heart of the democratic ideal, the power of the people, has been declared obsolete. In the time of globalization, you know, it doesn't meet sense of thinking of popular sovereignty. And this is why politics have become a mere technical issue of managing the established order, a domain reserved for experts. I mean, it's clear how we proceed. Because if there is no alternative, then there are no real decision, political decision that uh, uh, can, can be made, huh, or decision. Uh, then, of course, you know, the, the, it's a question of managing the established order. And this, if it's the okay, case, well, experts will do that much better than the citizen. You know? So th this is the, 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 the core of the post-political uh, vision. In fact, the only thing that post-politics allows it's a bipartisan alternation, alternation, not alternative, uh, alternation of power between the center-right and the center-left parties. All those who oppose this consensus at the center are, in fact, disqualified as being populist or they are uh, uh, accused of being extremist. And, in fact, we see that very much today. You know, the, the, every kind of party who, who challenge the, the consensus of the center are dismissed, disqualified as danger for democracy because they, uh, 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 are, they are seen as extremists. And, and this is, in fact, why the term populism has is, is got such a negative con connotation. But this is really, for me, a trick of the uh, 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 kind of center, right, center uh, uh, politics in order to disqualify people who put into question the uh, uh, consensus at the center. Those changes at the political level, the development of post-politics, have taken place within the context of a neoliberal hegemonic formation characterized by a form of regulation of capitalism in which the role of the financial capital is central. We have seen, in fact, an exponential increase in inequality affecting not only the working class, but also a great part of the middle classes, 
uh, who have entered a process of pauperization and precarization. So we are clearly witnessing what can be called a process of oligarchization of Western societies. Center-left parties have abandoned the struggle for equality, and their main slogans are now about choice and fairness, which was very clear, for instance, in the case of uh, uh, the Tony Blair and, and even uh, after Gordon Brown, when they were we are going to give uh, people the choice. Choice uh, to, to, to uh, choose your doctor, the school, and, uh, and as a consumer, more, but you know, the, the whole idea of equality disappeared from their vocabulary. So we can say that the two democratic ideals of equality and popular sovereignty, which are for me central to the democratic view, have been relinquished. And it can be said that we are now live in what are called post-democratic societies. To be sure, democracy is still spoken of, but only to indicate the, the liberal part of, of democracy. Uh, uh, universal suffrage and respect of majority rule. This evolution, far from being a process towards a more mature society, as it is often claimed, and I refer to that when I spoke of, of the third way, undermined the very foundation of our Western model of democracy, which is usually called liberal democracy, but I prefer to term pluralist democracy because I think what liberalism uh, political liberalism, of course, here I insist, no, is brought to the idea of democracy, is the idea of pluralism. As C.B. McPherson, the, the Canadian philosopher, has shown that model of liberal democracy was in fact the result of the articulation between two traditions. The first one, the liberal tradition of the rule of law, separation of power and the affirmation of individual freedom, so the political liberalism. And the second one, the democratic tradition of equality and popular sovereignty. No doubt, these two <coughs> political logic are ultimately irreconcilable. There is, oh, oh, uh, again, a whole discussion in political theory about that. Uh, and there will always be a tension between the principle of freedom and equality. But as I have argued in the democratic paradox, this tension is in fact constitutive of our democratic model, of the pluralist model, because it provides the space for an agonistic confrontation, and it is what guarantees pluralism. Through all European history, this tension between you know, liberty and, and, and equality has been negotiated through an agonistic struggle between parties of the right, which usually favor uh, 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 liberty, and parties of the left, which favor, emphasize equality. But in recent years, with the hegemony of neoliberalism, this left-right frontier has been blurred. That is what I call post-politics. And in fact, the space has disappeared where this agonistic confrontation between adversaries could take place. A characteristic of our post-democratic condition is that democratic aspiration can no longer find channel of expression within the traditional political uh, parties. The passion for equality, which according to Alexis de Tocqueville is the democratic passion par excellence, does not find a political terrain where it can be channeled towards emancipatory goals. And it is in such a context that various populist movements have emerged, rejecting post-politic and post-democracy. They claim that they are going to give back to the people the voice that has been confiscated by the elites. Regardless of the problematic form that some of those movements can take, because of course here, uh, 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 I mean, they, they are not say, say, saying that there is no fundamental difference and that some term form of populism are not you know, dangerous for democracy. But I think that, for, and, and, and pop, it's one of the points I really want to, 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 to bring to the fore, and, and it's very controversial, but it is important, I think, to recognize that those, different form of populism are in fact the expression of legitimate democratic aspiration. So the, the, it, it's, uh, it, even if, 
And that's the problem, is that those democratic aspirations can be articulated, expressed through different vocabularies. This is why the anti-essentialist perspective is, 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 is crucial, because this is, this is a democratic, par democratic demand, what they understand is people say, we want democracy, we want to have a voice. But I mean, the answer of right-wing populism is say, yeah, we are going to give you a voice. You know? and, and, and so the, 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 it's an answer to those democratic aspirations, but of course they construct the, 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 the we uh, uh, and the day uh, in, in the way in which the immigrants, for instance, so it, they construct the, this in a xenophobic language. But this originally is a democratic aspiration. Uh, and obviously the possibility for democratic demands to be constructed in a xenophobic way is something that most parties are unable to comprehend precisely because of their essentialist approach. You know, they are, they are people, are, that's why people, oh no, people vote for the right, they, because they are inherently uh, racist, uh, they no, no way, we do not, not even try to, 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 to make them change their mind. And this is why I submit that without adopting an anti-essentialist approach, a discursive approach, it's not possible to grasp the nature of the populist challenge. This challenge requires acknowledging that the people as a political category uh, the, the people is not an empirical reference, it's, 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 it's a performative, the people is constructed and it could be constructed in different ways. So the people as a political category can be constructed in different ways and not all of them have got a progressive orientation. Indeed, in several European countries, the aspiration for recovering the democratic ideals of equality and popular sovereignty, which have been discarded under post-democracy have been captured by right-wing populist parties. They have successfully mobilized common effects in view of constructing a people who will voice call for a democracy, but a democracy that exclusively uh, uh, dedicated to defending the interests of those considered of the true national. They construct the people through an ethno-nationalist discourse that exclude immigrants, which are considered as a threat to the national identity and prosperity. So this is, in my view, why, uh, 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 and, and during a long time, there was no attempt by the left to, provo to provide another dis discourse. Uh, it is, in my view, urgent to realize that it is the absence of a narrative offering a different vocabulary to formulate those democratic demands which explain the success of right-wing populism is a growing number of social sectors. <laughs> so I argue that what is needed is another narrative embodied in an ensemble of practices provide of affection, you know, prefer my friend to Spinoza, <coughs> providing the discursive inscription able to foster other form of identification. And I think that disqualifying those parties, and this is the, 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 the traditional uh, uh, attitude of, 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 of the left. Say, ah, oh, those parties, they are, uh, um, ex it's the extreme right, neo-fascist, but we don't have to, we know what it is, you know, it's, it's the return of the brown plague. So we don't have to try even to understand what, what, why people won't vote for them. You know, they, 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 this is a new, it's not a new phenomenon that require to, to, to understand what has happened. No, no, we, we know. We, we, it, it's enough to say, oh, that's extreme right, as it is neo-fascist. It's a, an easy way to dismiss their demands, refusing to acknowledge the democratic dimension of many of them, attributing their appeal to lack of education or the influence of atavistic factor is of course especially convenient for the forces of the center because it permits them to avoid recognizing their own responsibility in the emergence of those parties. Their answer is to say, no, we are going to pretend, protect the good Democrats against the danger of irrational passion by establishing a moral frontier so as to exclude the extremists from the democratic debate. This is really you know, the traditional uh, attitude, uh, in, not, not always, but when the, in France, definitively, with respect to the Front National. Uh, uh, um. 
And I think that the strategy of demonization of the enemies of the bipartisan consensus might be morally comforting. You know, we are the good Democrats, you know, those are, uh, but this is totally <coughs> disempowering politically. Instead of denigrating those demands, the task is to formulate them in a progressive way, to recognize that the origin there is, uh, dem there are democratic demands, and to formulate them in a way in which we are going to define the adversary, uh, the configuration of the forces that strengthen and promote the neo neoliberal uh, project. So the strategy to combat right-wing populism should consist in promoting a progressive populist movement, what I call a left-wing populism, populism that is receptive to those democratic aspirations and through the construction of another people will mobilize common affects towards a defense of equality and social justice. Because as Spinoza was keen to stress, an affect is it can only be displayed by an opposed affect that is stronger than the one to be repressed. So it's not through uh, rational argumentation uh, uh, and, and, and co moral condemnation that you are going to, 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 to stop the rise of right-wing populism, but by creating a common affect, creating other form of identification, which are going to be stronger than uh, the, the, the one which are proposed by uh, right-wing uh, populism. Facing the challenge that the populist moment represents for the future of democracy, requires the articulation of the collective will, a people, that establishes a synergy between the multiplicity of social movement and political forces, and whose objective is to recover, because you know, we are in post-democracy, so in fact we need to recover democracy, but in order not to restrict it to the national, but in order to extend it, to radicalize it, to deepen it. Given the, that numerous social sectors today suffer the effect of financialized capitalism, I think that there is a potential for this collective will to have a transversal character that exceeds the left-right distinction as traditionally configured. Huh? Uh, by that, I, 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 I understand the first, uh, the, well, no, capital labor. No, this is the, 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 the question. And speaking of uh, a transversal means that there are many more uh, 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 groups or the identity that can be won over for that project. For instance, when, when Podemos was say, saying, uh, we are, they, they did not want uh, to be identified with the left because they say, we don't, we in fact want to, we are convinced that there are people who uh, uh, currently vote for the Partido Popular, the, uh, the, 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 the right-wing party, that can be won, o won over to our project because they are suffering from the uh, uh, policies of, of the Partido Popular and from the processes of precarization and, and the, the anti-austerity policies, the, 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 sorry, the, 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 pol the austerity policies. So they can, if, if, if we pre present ourselves as, you know, ah, we are different the left, they, they are not. They are going to be receptive to our view, but but you know we, we, we need to win them over. So we need this is the idea of the transversal character. You know they they, they are not the, 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 the already the distinction which exists between left and right can be transcended. Uh, th th this is the, the argument that, that they make. But uh, I've got some, some disagreement with them about, about, I mean, some agreement and some disagreement, because I think that nevertheless we can't abandon completely the, 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 the idea of the left. But this is something, I mean, I, I, I discussed that in, in the book for left populism. But uh, um, so basically what I uh, uh, think is that conceive in a progressive uh, uh, way populism far from being a perversion of democracy, constitute in fact, in today's Europe, the most adequate force for recover democracy and for defend it, of left populism, of course. You know, I think that uh, uh, it, it's, it's a chance for democracy. It's not something that put democracy at, at, at risk. The main obstacle to the implementation of such left populist strategy is that most left parties do not understand the crucial role played by common affects in the constitution of political identities and the importance of mobilizing passion in a democratic direction. They are influenced by the view dominant in democratic political theory according to which passion should be excluded from democratic politics. 
because you know, that's only what the right and the fascists uh, do. Uh, we, we use argument, not uh, uh, passion. And this, the, the, the left should really limit itself to rational argument and deliberative procedure. Uh, this, this is the, the dominant view among, among you know, the center left, and, and not only center left, also you know, more, more radical form of left. I think that there is no doubt that one of the reasons for their hostility to populism is that, and, 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 and by the way, um, this is also, the, so the, this not understanding the role of uh, a passion, common affect in, in the creation of political identities and the fact that if you don't mobilize affect in a progressive way, they are going to be mobilized by, by the right. They are being mobilized by the right. And I think this is this rationalist conception, rejection of the role of uh, 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 affect, is why they are unable to answer the challenge posed by the rights of right wing populist movement. Such movement do in fact understand that politics is always partisan and that it requires the creation of a frontier between we and they. They are also well aware of the need to mobilize affect to construct political identities. So if, if, if the left is not entering that terrain, it's not going to be able to answer the challenge of writing populism. I'm convinced that in the next few years, the central axis of the political conflict will be between right-wing populism and left populism. And it is imperative that progressive sector understand the importance of involving themselves in that struggle. The best way to fight against those parties is not by accusing them of populism, uh, condemning their appeal to affect. It is only through the construction of another people a collective will that result from the mobilization of passion in defense of equality and social justice, that it will be possible to combat the xenophobic policies promoted by right-wing populism. So, in fact, we could say that by recreating political frontier after, you know, post-politics, the populist movement that we are witnessing in Europe points to a return of the political a return that may open the way for authoritarian solution, that's for sure. And that will be through regime that weaken liberal democratic institution. But it can also lead to the reaffirmation and deepening of democratic values. Everything will depend on the kind of populism that emerged victorious from the struggle against post-politic and post-democracy. Thank you. Yes, sure. Thank you. I don't think I'm going to take. Uh, I'm going to take. I give you the mic, but I don't know what is working. Thanks. Yeah. So thanks, Chantal, for this really uh, provocative uh, talk. Uh, coupled, of course, uh, both um, uh, with uh, theoretical analysis and uh, uh, call for action. Uh, and the latter is something I think we're seeing very little of uh, these days. So in a way, it's, uh, uh, it's a move in the direction of trying to find a theoretical basis for what democratic political action could look like. So I'm going to give uh, the mic here first to Rafael. Thank you for your talk. Very provocative. Uh, I have two questions. I have always been intrigued by what, what I seem to perceive a difference of emphasis in your work and in Ernesto Laclau's work. And it has to do with precisely what you were talking about, the difference between an agonistic understanding of politics as opposed to an antagonistic one. A difference between an emphasis on the friend-enemy distinction and an emphasis on our adversarial relationships. In my reading of Laclau, which might be limited, uh, for instance, I'm thinking of, of on populist reason, I do not see the kind of adversarial understanding of politics that you 
have made so much through, not only in this talk, but in other, in other interventions, but more a Schmittian notion of politics as the construction of a frontier, a distinction between a we and a they that is predicated on, on relations, relationship of enmity and so on and so forth. So I would like you to com comment on that a little bit if you can. And the other thing I would like you to ask is what kinds of left-wing or right-wing uh, populist or movements, or especially populist movements in power, you see that kind of adversarial understanding of politics at work. That's it. Yes, okay, so, the, I mean, in, 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 yeah, okay, no, I think I've understood. If, if I have uh, not understood, you, you'll correct me. Uh, well, I don't think that, uh, 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 with respect to Ernesto, we did not have any fundamental theoretical refer differences. The question is that, uh, uh, in fact, Ernesto's point of references were mainly Latin America. So it, the question here is, is which conjuncture? This is why I insisted that uh, 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 my reflection about uh, 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 left populism, I, since the beginning, say I am speaking to the conjuncture in Western Europe. This is why I say not, not even you know, uh, uh, all of uh, uh, the, the Europe. Uh, and of course, it's very different from the, 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 the conjuncture that uh, existed in, in Latin America at the moment in, in, in which, uh, uh, well, the different populist movement. You know, there are, there are societies in which they're much more antagonistic. You know, because in order to have an agonistic discussion uh, <laughs> or an agonistic type of politics, you need to have the opponent who accept the, the, the agonism. If you uh, uh, don't accept that, and in fact, uh, th this is, for instance, for me, what has been the, the main problem with, the, uh, 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 with Venezuela, is that since the beginning, the opposition never accepted the legitimacy of Chavez. Chavez was, you know, he was a mestizo, he was somebody with, you know, uh, and the oligarchy always considered that this guy, this guy is illegitimate. So they, they, they never treated this as, as an adversary. It was an enemy. In fact, they, 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 they did a coup d'etat in order to try to get rid of him. So, you know, it's, it's difficult to treat, treat as an adversary uh, a, a group that treats you as an enemy. So you need to have, uh, they need to have some democratic tradition which existed, you know, in order to uh, have the possibility of this agonistic uh, struggle. And this is, of course, something that exists in, in a certain extent in, 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 in Western Europe, but that did not exist in, in uh, Latin America. And this is, I think, what, what explains the, 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 the difference mainly. Because my, my, I, I, I've been in, uh, uh, interested in, in uh, populist politics for a long time, in fact, oh, before, uh, uh, more, more than yeah, at least 20, 20 years. But I've always been interested in uh, Western Europe. For instance, I, the, the, the case which I originally uh, studied best was the, the FPÖ in Austria. You know, this, in fact, was the origin of many of my reflections. So the development of right-wing populism in, 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 in Europe. And I still was never particularly interested in, in that. I mean, as an object of reflection, it's not that he was not interested in what was happening, but this is what is, uh, was not his object of reflection. So I think that is the different conjuncture which explain why uh, uh, our work seems to be you know, different. Big for instance, Ernesto agree completely with me about the, the, this, this question of uh, agonism and antagonism. So I don't think that we, we could say that he was more Schmidtian than that uh, I was. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm the, it's very funny because uh, he's accused of being a Schmidtian, but in fact, Ernesto was never particularly interested in the work of Schmidt. Uh, uh, in fact, it has often been when, when I, so that's something that I want to, to uh, uh, clarify because hegemonic socialist strategy is often accused because of our insistence on antagonism of the Schmidtian. You know, <laughs> when we wrote it, neither Ernesto nor I had read Karl Schmidt. In fact, it's after the, 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 the publication of the book that a friend of mine, a Greek a political theorist, asked me, by the way, 
you know, do you know the work of Carl Schmitt? And I said, no, I've never heard it. He said, well, you should read the contemporary political because I'm sure you are going to be interested. You will find a lot of point, you know, of, uh, in, in common. And then I, 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 that's when I, I, I read Schmidt, and of course I, I've never ceased reading Schmidt because I think for me is probably my uh, preferred adversary, you know, because my, uh, but and it's never read that 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 that. So to say that is more Schmidtian, and that, no, I don't think. I, honestly, I think that the difference uh, is explained in, in terms of the different context that we were studying. Uh, with respect to the, the, the um, if I understood well the question, the second one. Well, where, where I see uh, the attempt to, to um, have this kind of agonistic po politics in practice is, is well, m m for me, uh, Podemos, La France Insoumise, uh, uh, those movements that I would define as, as following a left populist strategy are uh, putting into question this, because uh, they are not, for instance, treating and this is why, for instance, in, in, in the, 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 the book that I've just uh, finished, I make the distinction between, I say, when we speak of the left, when in fact we distinguish three types of left. There's the reformist left, you know, the, the social democrats, which are in fact now uh, become so totally social liberals. You know, th those who accept the, the, the existing order and say there is no alternative, that's on one side. On the other extreme, you've got the, 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 the revolutionary left, you know, the extreme, called extreme left, even if I don't like this step, say, no, no, we need to uh, abolish the capitalist system. Uh, uh, there is no possibility of making within the, the framework of, of a pluralist democracy important changes. Uh, so, you know, the, the system must be destroyed and something completely new. Uh, uh, so this is definitely an antagonistic form of politics, you know, the, we need... And in fact, what the, the position of left-wing populism for me is some, what I call a form of radical reformism. That is a, a strategy of engaging with the institution. I mean, and of course, all those parties are parties which uh, want to uh, come to power, but come to through a democratic election. You know, they, they, they are not uh, uh, in strategies of rejecting the, the liberal democratic institution, they want to transform them, but they don't want to offer a radical alternative. So this is for me the kind of agonistic politics that, uh, but of course it's, it's not, ni, ni, none of them has come to power yet, I hope. Uh, um, and, and so it's, you can't say that this is something which is really put, put in, 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 into, into practice uh, yet. Uh, my name is Yanis Malidis, and I have the following question. I feel that democracy is becoming the tyranny of the majority against the minority. Is there any other way, a better way, to govern a society and let the people feel free and do as they like to do? Is there any chance to evolve into a better type of government ship than democracy, instead of putting adjectives to that what we call democracy today. Thank you. Well, I disagree with you on the fact that <laughs> we are seeing the majority, uh, 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 well, no, the, 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 uh, let me put it in a different ways. I think that, that uh, there is certainly no, no tyranny of the majority. What we are seeing today, and, and this is definitely a part of this, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking again about uh, Western Europe, huh? when I'm speaking of the process of oligarchization of our societies, uh, is the fact that no, uh, the very small majority of very rich people are the ones who control uh, uh, everything. This is a consequence of, 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 of neoliberalism. And this is very different from instance from the situation that existed before, before the hegemony of, of neoliberalism, which we can, you know, basically in, in Europe, be, it began in the 80s with the development of, uh, of Thatcher. And before that, we had another uh, hegemonic uh, formation, which we can call the social democratic uh, uh, at the moment of the post-war uh, uh, Keynesian welfare state. Uh, well, things were really, it was 
I'm not going to present that as you know wonderful without any problem. But they, the question of inequalities were certainly not so big, you know, and and the the, the relation of power between the the the, the, the groups there was certainly a capitalist society, but you know the, the trade unions were strong. The trade unions were impeding the 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 the, 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 the policies, which were later uh, implemented by neoliberalism. So I think that we are definitively today in, in a much worse situation in terms of uh, uh, you know, social condition that we were under the hegemony of, uh, well, let's call it social democratic hegemony, you know, the, the Canadian welfare state. Uh, uh, and, and for instance, if you compare, and they, they are, I, I think that a good reference to that is the book by Thomas Piketty, Capitalism in the 21st Century, where he show the exponential uh, uh, increase of inequalities under uh, uh, neoliberalism. So, and, and of course, the, 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 this little group is the one who controls uh, all, all the most important policies. So we are, in fact, no, not at all in, in a situation in which the, 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 the uh, tyranny of the majority, we are in a situation in which, yeah, what I call oligarchization is a small group of uh, uh, very powerful uh, 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 con conglomerates of, of uh, um, transnational corporation and their political representatives who control things. So uh, uh, that uh, so let's say the diagnostic is 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 definitely not the same. But I, I imagine that you are in a sense uh, uh, thinking what kind of order could we have in which everybody will be will be free and we will well i don't think that that can exist because precisely the uh, uh, um, my model is recognizing the existence of, of antagonism they will always be society will always be divided you know then so the question it will always be a question of of performance and the, the interesting way to think about that is is uh, and, and and there is a, a um, something which has been um, developed by uh, uh, Nicole Loro. She's a, a French uh, classicist. She wrote a lot about, about uh, ancient Greece. And, and she insists on the fact that the most kratos, she says, kratos means, uh, I've read that in French and I'm called, avoir le dessus. So it's, 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 a, it's a form of, of uh, the, the most kratos, it, it means that it, it's, there is always relation of power. You know, so there is a part, which is the demos, which really is, or is always in a position of superiority. And if we add to that the, uh, what I've uh, uh, said, that the demos, according to my uh, interpretation of uh, uh, what I call dissociative uh, conception of politics, the people is divided. No, that's also, for instance, uh, I will refer, could refer to Machiavelli, who say there's always il popolo e grandi. This is, this is what, you know, society is divided. There will always be, uh, uh, it means that the, 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 the Marxist idea of communism, when we want, to, you know, once there is no more uh, class oppression, then we live, we live in a society in which, complain, no, this, this can't, according to my view, this is totally impossible. So we'll always live in hegemonic uh, uh, societies in which there is, or the people is divided, and it's always a system in which part of the society will rule over the, the, the other one. But of course, that, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, it can, the, it's going to take place in the same way. There are forms of hegemony which are much more progressive, accountable, democratic. So for me, what uh, is important is to try to make uh, the, the working of democracy more accountable, more democratic, more, more possibility precisely for people to have a voice, but knowing that there will always be uh, 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 this distinction. And this is, for instance, something in which I, I, I think that the, the division that we find uh, in some, remember, for instance, what uh, Occupy Wall Street was saying, the 99% again, the 1%. Sorry, but this is too optimistic. The problem is not only the one person; it's much more. You know, society is much more divided than that. So we've got to live with with with, with that uh, and try. And for me, this is precisely the challenge for democracy. How are we going to you know, create the the the, the possibility to having uh, less inequality, more uh, participation, but knowing that this perfect democracy in which everybody will be uh, uh, free and no no 
the, without relation of domination, it's impossible. This is why I also say the, the distinction, the, 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 what I call the agonistic struggle between liberty and equality will always, there is no end to that. Some people believe, for instance, Habermas believe that there is a co-originality between liberty and equality, that they can be perfectly reconciled. I don't think it is possible. Perfect liberty and perfect equality cannot exist together. There will always be either it's democracy uh, or, uh, in the sense of equality, which is the dominant logic, or is the other one. But there was the agonistic conflict we never see. I'm going to call it a, a day or a night with uh, <laughs> that uh, prognosis about uh, the future conflictual uh, nature of uh, society. Thank you very much once again uh, for this talk, and I hope uh, we'll see you again, especially after the book uh, is out. Uh, it'll be another opportunity to uh, discuss a lot of the thesis that you have put forward um, uh, tonight. Thank you very much for being with us, and we have two events in May, and one on the 14th of March, and then, oh sorry, yes, we have one on the 14th of March, uh, and then two um, in May. So I have a bad memory, uh, uh, but I'm not going to give you the wrong dates. Please look at our website, and uh, the uh, center has a very up-to-date web page, and you will find all the three announcements for the uh, events this semester. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.